when you talk about the Kennedy administration, the Kennedy presidency, there are, as we've said, these iconic images that most people use to identify or define the whole presidency. The inaugural speech, right? The other, uh, the other huge one has to be his speech in Berlin. The enthusiasm with which the crowds received his comments, the, the spokesman of the free world coming to Berlin. Moving through thriving post-war West Berlin, all at once, we are confronted with a sudden, sharp contrast to the busy metropolis. A stark reminder of the city's wartime years, a monument to its years of tyranny and dictatorship. Going back to the final days of World War II, under the combined assault of the United States on one side and the Russians on the other, Hitler's Germany was defeated. When the two sides met up at the Elba River, there were fervent toasts to peace. We see ecstatic faces of Russian prisoners of war freed by the Americans. The Nazi swastika trampled and the genuine hope that the Allies would work together to secure a long-lasting peace. But there was work to be done. Order needed to be restored in the defeated country. With the signing of the Berlin Declaration of June 5, 1945, Britain, France, the United States, and Russia assumed supreme authority in regard to Germany. In good faith, the British and Americans agreed to pull back from the Elba River to an agreed-upon divide. The Allies split Germany up into four occupation zones. French, British, American, and Russian. Berlin was left unclaimed, its fate to be decided by a future unified Germany. But since the city was within the Russian area of occupation, an agreement was necessary to allow for Western access. That same month, June 1945, an exchange of letters between President Truman and Marshal Stalin led to an arrangement of free and unimpeded access routes to Berlin. specific roads, railways, waterways, canals, and air routes were decided upon. Willy Brandt, the West Berlin mayor who had done much for the swift economic development of the city, appealed to Western allies for protection from the Soviets. The American military presence in Berlin was minimal, with only three garrisons and 12,000 men, compared to 20 divisions the Soviets had surrounding the city. Though the West made a show of strength, it was more symbolic than anything real.
Willie Brandt visited Washington to discuss the situation. and try to get a feel for the new president's position. The president expressed the continued interest of the American people and government in Berlin. He reiterated the determination of the United States in cooperation with its allies to preserve and maintain the freedom of the people of West Berlin to which it is committed by treaty and conviction. The stage for the 1961 Vienna Conference had been set the previous year in Paris when Khrushchev stormed out of the meetings over the recent U-2 incident threatening to sign a treaty with East Germany that would exclude the Allies from Berlin. A year later, meeting with newly elected President Kennedy in Vienna, Khrushchev repeated his claim that East Berlin was the capital of a sovereign Berlin and again threatened to sign a treaty with East Germany to end all Western rights to Berlin. On August 13, 1961, a line of East German police created a wall in front of the Brandenburg Gate. The people of West Germany stood opposite them in loud protest, voicing their dissent. As tensions rose, the East Germans were forced to fire water cannons to disperse the crowd of protesters. As the wall went up, many East Germans made a last scramble for freedom. The defections were not limited to civilians only. Ultimately, on August 12, 1961, when the wall finally went up, Brandt was critical of what he felt was inadequate response on the part of the Western allies and America in particular. Brick by brick, the harsh realities and growing tensions of a city divided were now literally set in stone. When Chancellor Adenauer visited the newly constructed wall, he was met with radio truck insults and endless barbed wire. A few still managed to make their escape, mostly at night or through hastily improvised tunnels though many would find their end at the hands of an East German bullet. Vast spaces, once a swarm of bustle and commotion, stood silent and empty. The wall would mark the end of the line for freedom. Kennedy was quick to address the nation about the sudden tensions in Berlin.
As was typical of the Kennedy administration, the problem was approached from many different fronts. Along with apprising the American public of the situation, diplomacy, mostly through NATO channels, was attempted in hopes of resolving the conflict without resorting to military measures. Meanwhile, not only was the wall an economic divider, but more significantly, it divided a once united people from themselves. President Kennedy's address to the nation has been hailed by the nation's allies as the only reply the West could give to red threats in Berlin. He spoke quietly, yet firmly. Good evening. Seven weeks ago tonight, I returned from Europe to report on my meeting with Premier Khrushchev and the others. His grim warnings about the future of the world, his aid memoir on Berlin, the subsequent speeches and threats which he and his agents have launched, and the increase in the Soviet military budget that he has announced have all prompted a series of decisions by the administration and a series of consultations with the members of the NATO organization. The immediate threat to free men is in West Berlin, but that isolated outpost is not an isolated problem. The threat is worldwide. Our efforts must be equally wide and strong and not be obsessed by any single manufactured crisis. We face a challenge in Berlin, but there is also a challenge in Southeast Asia where the borders are less guarded, the enemy harder to find, and the dangers of communism less apparent to those who have so little. We face a challenge in our own hemisphere, and indeed wherever else, the freedom of human beings is at stake. The world is not deceived by the communist attempt to label Berlin as a hotbed of war. There is peace in Berlin today. The source of world trouble and tension is Moscow, not Berlin. And if war begins, it will have begun in Moscow and not Berlin. For the choice of peace or war is largely theirs, not ours. Berlin was the epicenter of the Iron Curtain, only in a brick formation. Berlin represented symbolic of the war going on that all these people were just pawns of, you know, inconsequential. And here's John Kennedy, the leader of the free world, uh, connecting, identifying himself with them. I am a Berliner extraordinary you know you you talk to people who lived in europe east europe and they'll tell you, you know, in the in the dinkiest little countryside home there'd be two photographs on the wall jesus and john kennedy now how does that happen that john kennedy the president of the united states would have that kind of global um <laughs> uh, celebrity and support that people would feel something for an American president. That's extraordinary. A city does not become free merely by calling it a free city. For a city or a people to be free requires that they be given the opportunity without economic, political, or police pressure to make their own choice and live their own lives. The people of West Berlin today have that freedom. It is the objective of our policy that they will continue to enjoy it. Peace does not come automatically from a, quote, peace treaty, unquote. There is peace in Germany today, even though the situation is abnormal. A peace treaty that adversely affects the lives and rights of millions will not bring peace with it. A peace treaty that attempts to affect adversely the solemn commitments of three great powers will not bring peace with it. We again urge the Soviet government 
to reconsider its course, to return to the path of constructive cooperation it so frequently states it desires, and to work with its World War II allies in concluding a just and enduring settlement of issues remaining from that conflict. The Berlin Wall was the first wall in recorded history to keep people in and not out. Before it was erected, three and a half million East German citizens had escaped into West Berlin. If people managed to get by the guards and their guns, there was the wall itself, which functioned as a series of defenses all rolled into one. Barbed wire on the outside, the wall itself, and then on top of the wall, set into the concrete, shards of broken glass. Over 100 people had been killed attempting to cross the border. The East German guards were ordered to shoot one another if one of them attempted to escape. Windows were sealed with bricks where attempts had been made to jump over the wall into West Berlin. The gulf between the two sections, though small physically, in effect was immeasurable. On June 26, 1963, a short distance from the wall and overlooking the east, the people of West Berlin were expecting a visitor, the President of the United States of America. There are many people in the world who really don't understand, or say they don't, what is the great issue between the free world and the communist world. 
Let them come to Berlin. There are some who say, there are some who say that communism is the wave of the future. Let them come to Berlin. Even a few who say that it's true that communism is an evil system, but it permits us to make economic progress. Lass sie nach Berlin in common. Let them come to Berlin. Freedom has many difficulties, and democracy is not perfect. But we have never had to put a wall up to keep our people in, to prevent them from leaving us. While the wall is the most obvious, and vivid demonstration of the failures of the communist system. For all the world to see, we take no satisfaction in it. For it is, as your mayor has said, an offense not only against history, but an offense against humanity, separating families, dividing husbands and wives and brothers and sisters and dividing up people who wish to be joined together. Freedom is indivisible. And when one man is enslaved, all are not free. All, all free men, wherever they may live are citizens of Berlin. And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the words, Ich bin ein Berliner. And the Berlin uh, speech uh, doesn't answer for it fully, but it certainly contributes to the reputation he enjoyed internationally. And, and, and of course, he is cognizant of that. And that's why all of the other things in his administration have to harmonize with that image. He has to be that spokesman for the free world. And all of his policies have to reflect that. He has to avoid embarrassment. He has to avoid uh, failure. He has to avoid defeat. He cannot look weak. He has to look strong. He has to speak strong. And talking and connecting with the people reflects another way of winning the war in the hearts and minds of people that don't involve bombs, that don't involve planes that don't involve the high risk of failure or nuclear annihilation. It's brilliant. It's perfect, Kennedy.